And in my culture, in my family, people around me have even said, oh, you don't need the label. Oh, you're no different to us. <laughs> All of these yeah. things. I'm yeah. like, okay, yeah. I am. Yeah. <laughs> I accept my labels. Hello and welcome to Unseen, Unheard, the podcast where we discuss the black disabled experience in the UK's music industry. My name's Joy Addo and I'll be your host. Today I am joined by the lovely Lauren Fernandez and she's going to tell us all about what she does and things like that. But Lauren, first of all, how are you today? I'm good, thanks. I'm feeling very heavy. Yeah, you are pregnant. <laughs> I am pregnant. Due very, very soon. Very soon. Baby about five is coming. weeks. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> um, but I'm feeling good. I'm feeling positive and blessed and happy. So, good. other than the heaviness. Oh, yeah. yeah. That'll be gone soon. Before yeah. you know it, you'll be like, whew. Then it'll be tiredness. Yes, then it'll be... <laughs> It'll be um, sleepless nights, yeah. and night feeds, yeah. but that's all good. It's part of the. <laughs> it's part, part of, of the bigger plan, yeah. Oh, <laughs> so, no, we were speaking about pregnancy and stuff earlier, wasn't we? And it was just like, oh God, it's taking me back, like my child seven now. I'm like, <laughs> wow. Um, but Lauren, tell us a bit and tell everyone who's listening and watching this a bit about yourself, your career, what you do in the music industry, how you got started. Give us a backstory. So my backstory is I'm Lauren. I came into the music industry through live events. So I'm an alcohol licensee, um, which means essentially that I have the license that you attach to a building mm. to be able to run a premises. Um, I've had that since 2016. So seven years now. I think seven years and um, as I said like running premises running events in the years just before my pregnancy mm -hmm. um, I wanted to scale up so I wanted to move on to festivals and definitely more on the operational side mm -hmm. is where I sit behind the scenes yeah um, and yeah I scaled up I did some production roles I've worked in site offices I've camped out for three weeks and how was that <laughs> fun <laughs> sleepless I've never camped in my life well I I wasn't camping camping <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't have worked I wouldn't have been able to work um I had like this cabin so you know those um the crates what are they called oh it's gone out of my head but essentially the steel box okay yeah they're crates containers containers okay yeah so they convert them into like this mini miniature flat with a bathroom and two oh. beds in it oh yeah so you're in this air airtight container mm. and I've, I've stayed in one of those for three weeks and that was very interesting um yeah i wouldn't have been able to sleep outside on the grass <laughs> for three weeks my body would have seized up <laughs> i really want to try it though like actual camping I have camped before, not for work, but it is really fun. I actually quite like the outdoors, so just in very small doses. Mm. Mm. No, I'm an <laughs> aircon girl, to be fair. <laughs> oh, no, I don't like aircon. So would you say, so 2016, you said that you kind of started and how have you found the industry? Like, how, how has work been? Like, how is your work-life balance? Like, how is it? Balance. <laughs> balance. What, what is that? Hard. Hard one, isn't it? You need to know the balance. Mm. <laughs> um, We're still getting there. So it's work in progress. Yeah. So I would say that for me, in the role that I tend to play, which would be director, manager of the premises, I always used to say that it's 24-7 mm -hmm. because if your licence is attached to a building, you are on call 24-7, whether you're there or not. Right. You're responsible for that building, that premises and what happens inside and then as a result of patrons leaving, for example. Um, when it comes to balance, friends, I would say 
My nine to five, my Monday to Friday is Friday to Sunday. Mm. Bank holidays, weekends, mm. Christmas day. Don't expect me to be available for plans because that right. is when... That's when all the events are happening. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So don't, just count me out, yeah. <laughs> basically. Um, for me, I'm very money oriented. So I was able to kind of throw myself into that. And I would say I had a I had a time in my early twenties, so <laughs> I don't feel like I had missed out on too much mm -hmm. because I did a lot of partying. If yeah. that wasn't clear, as, uh, you're, as you're supposed to yeah. in your twenties, <laughs> so um, it was really time for me to buckle down and focus and just channel myself into making more money and trying to reach being a millionaire by the time I was thirty, which didn't happen. But you got to your forty. <laughs> okay yeah. after 30 there's yeah, 40 true. that's fine that's You're right fine. that's right you got time you got time that's interesting and and it's interesting that you said about like the balance and kind of like you know you you were working on the weekends while mm -hmm. everyone else was like out and stuff yeah. that's your work time obviously we spoke about it a bit lauren but for the people listening who don't know can you tell us about your disability and tell me how you think it affects, or if it has actually, oh, yeah. affected your working life. So yeah, tell us a bit about that. So when I was 26, my sister, I, was, um, I wasn't living in London at the time. Mm -hmm. I was living in the Midlands with family, my, my family. And my younger sister, who's 10 years younger than me, came home with an autism and ADHD diagnosis and I've always been different and knew that I was different and the way that my mum had tried to help me and the channels that she took they were never successful and nothing ever came out of it so um, when she came home with those diagnoses I was like that makes sense mm -hmm. I can see I, I don't know what that is yeah and how that presents in us being black females but mm -hmm. If my sister's got that diagnosis, it's definitely something that I need to look into. So I did. I went to my GP and went through the referrals and all the tests and assessments. And then they diagnosed me. I only went for an autism diagnosis because as far as I was concerned, ADHD is those naughty white boys mm -hmm. that I used to see in class. The ones that would throw chairs around and... Yeah the behaviour was just in a completely different world mm -hmm. to what I was used to. So yep. I had my autism diagnosis and at the end, the therapist or the consultant, he said, um, yeah, we think that there's a lot of indicators for ADHD. I was like, no, there's no <laughs> way. <laughs> not me. Not me, that's not possible. And then I kind of, I had to think about it because obviously it's in my control. Yep. And I said, well, if the expert thinks that then why not have a look and see if that's what could also be there yeah and then I was um diagnosed subsequently with ADHD also full full remarks on all the tests and because it shows itself differently doesn't it yeah. like you're you know you thinking about school days and those kind of boys that it was mm -hmm. but actually it presents itself differently in different people and men and women as well doesn't definitely, it? Definitely completely differently um, so I definitely internalised a lot and because I was different and I grew up in areas where I wasn't necessarily surrounded by other black people I already stood out Yeah. so what I now know as masking yep. that was built in I somehow built that into myself mm -hmm. that was part of my package yeah and um, I just got on with it. So I was able to hide traits that I didn't even know that I had without knowing that I was doing that, if it makes sense. Yeah. Um, so the second part of your question, how that affects me in work. Positively and negatively, because positively it enables me to keep going. It enables me to have a focus. It keeps me driven. Um I can very easily get up for a day at work, but if you ask me to get up on the day when I don't have anything to do, yeah, that might not happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I might roll around for 10 hours. Um, so it helps me with those aspects. But I think with 
neurodivergence in particular, autism and ADHD, even though I feel like I am, I can be in the room and I can be fully present, mm -hmm. I still seem to stand out to the other people in that room. So, for example, in work, a lot of my mannerisms and gestures and the way that I would do things or the way that I would respond or take things too seriously mm -hmm. these things kind of highlighted me and and set me aside from other people so <clears throat> I do get a bit of a reputation for being a bit stiff or not being able to take a joke really yeah um I usually wear colored glasses okay because I have a condition called Erlen syndrome okay so generally black text on white background moves and makes me feel really dizzy and ill and all of those kind of things. So I wear these tinted glasses and um, when I moved back down to London, I was running a, a I'd call it quite famous, uh, cocktail bar in <laughs> London somewhere. And people, sorry, my lenses were pink. Mm -hmm. So people used to come in and just call me a Power Ranger. <laughs> I laugh now, but at the time I would say that's not funny. Yeah. You know, someone yeah. might not be able to take that joke. Yeah, I'm not taking that joke. We're not friends. Yeah, you know, I don't know why you'd feel so comfortable to take yeah. the Mickey out of me all the time. Um, but it just continues. It's like the more that I would resist things like that, the more that it made it fun for other people. Yeah. Um, Cyclops as well. I would get called. Right. So yeah. I used to get called that back in the day as well. So like, why would you do that? People, people are very brave, you know. Yeah. But, you know, they don't realise I'm from Peckham. So <laughs> you know, just, just, do you know what I mean? It's just, but it's, yeah. No, people, it, it's, it's about boundaries, isn't it? People, mm. like, they don't know you. They just, like, I, I remember one time I came out of a club. Um, it was, like, four in the morning. Mm. And obviously everyone was, like, drunk and stuff. And some guy came up to me and was like, wow, your glasses are really thick. Like, you must scare all the children. Oh, my god! And I gosh. was like, <clears throat> I didn't even know what to do. Like, <clears throat> you know, sometimes things happen and in the moment you don't know what to say yeah. or what to do. And then afterwards I was like, no, oh, did he just... In my head, I, was, I yeah. just don't feel gangster. <laughs> I'm, I'm full not a gangster, just for the record. Norm. But, yeah, peck mom, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, but, yeah, I was just like... That is so rude. Like, I don't even know you. Mm. And yeah, people just, they just, they don't, they don't have boundaries and they just, sometimes people just say ridiculous things to people. And also they don't know the effect that that can have on people as yeah. well. Like I say, so I would not necessarily take it, but I'd always try and assert myself when someone made a joke like that. Mm. More so because, um, like I say, other people, you don't know how people are going to react. I would say things like, you don't know, I could go home and self-harm because of what you've said to me. It might be funny to you, but it's not necessarily funny to me. So just trying to make people think about what they're actually saying and what they're coming out with. Yeah. Um, with regards to that also, I think a place where my... Being in that live music industry, a lot of people are comfortable with touch. Right. And I'm not comfortable with people touching me by mm -hmm. any means. Not a hand on the shoulder, not... Do these gestures that are seen as normal, yeah. they're not normal to me and they make me feel really uncomfortable. So again, that's where that kind of image of me being uptight and people come up to you and put their arm around you and then I'd like yeah. remove their arm. <laughs> they're like, oh, what's wrong with you, man? We're friends. And I'm like, well, I'm, we're actually not your friend. We're, not, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're colleagues, I work here. We're <laughs> I work here, you're a customer. <laughs> or, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm your boss, yeah. you're the dirt. Yeah. And it's and then it's like, oh, you're so uptight or you're so this. And I'm like, well, again, you don't know what people have been through and you don't know what people are comfortable with. So why would you just walk up to somebody and touch them? Mm. And why would you think that that's okay? You know, consent is a thing. And then it's like, oh, you're so serious all the time. I'm like, I'm just saying it how it is. This, I'm uncomfortable just, with just what, how you're making me feel. And that, you know, yeah. I'm going to vocalise it, so... 
And that's yeah. interesting that you're so, like, you seem so comfortable and confident with vocalising it in those kind of situations. Mm. Has it always been that way or was it a bit of a process to get you to that stage where you could be at work and actually say to people, no, do you know what, don't touch me or I don't, you know what I mean? Did, did you have to get to that stage? I definitely had to get to that stage. I'm very, um, I have a very strong sense of justice. So if something doesn't feel right to me in that moment, I might not be able to express myself in the best way in that moment, Mm -hmm. but I will try my best. And I think a lot of it for me personally goes, so I'm like breathing. (laughs) um, A lot of it for me goes back to my younger siblings and thinking about how they would be in those situations and if they would have the confidence. So... It helps me a lot to say, if this were my younger sister, would she say that? If I if I explain to this one person who's done this to me, how much of an impact does that change? That helps me a lot to remove myself from the situation yep. and just act as though I'm defending my younger sister or my younger brother, for example. But I think being a big sister is a, is a big part of that kind of advocation and standing up for myself, although I have been told or it would seem from the outside that I have no issues (laughs) (laughs) asserting myself which I don't I understand people do have a lot more challenges in expressing themselves but yeah yeah, I'm quite outspoken in that way I think that's a good thing though it's not that's a good thing yeah why not I mean so now that you're able to to do that and like advocate for yourself at work, have you found that things are a lot easier? And, and also, did you did you see anyone else in a similar role to you in the industry that also had access requirements at all? And did you ever, like, was you always happy and willing and able to disclose what you was dealing with, what you're going through, what your situation is? Because a lot of people, I feel like, don't. And even myself, like... Mm. You know, sometimes I don't always like feel comfortable to disclose like what I actually need, like what support I need at work or at social events. So disclosing and asking for access requirements for me, Mm. I'm very rigid in my way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So I don't really think of it as am I comfortable or am I not? I think of it more from an aspect of, if I don't tell this employer this, yep. then they can't be prepared when I come back at them and say, you've done this wrong to me. Yep. Um, so that's more where I'd say I come from in that respect. Mm. So I've had two employers since being diagnosed and one of them, I was in the process of being diagnosed at that time. So I said, you know, I'm going through this process. I'm not sure if this is what the outcome will be, but if it if it is, then it will be that I'm autistic and ADHD. But as, as of right now, these are the things that would help me, regardless of any diagnosis or not. Right. And I think that was a very powerful thing. Yeah. Um, and it turned out to be very lucky that I actually did do that because I had some legal issues with them in the end mm-hmm. and my departure and how I was treated or not treated and them not keeping to their side of our contract. Um, So it just helped me. It just gave me that further bit of backup to know that I had disclosed something to them in the beginning. So it's not like they could say, oh, you didn't tell us that you would suffer in this way or that these things might trigger you. Yeah. Um, They had no chance. (laughs) Interesting. Um, But I understand that it is very, very difficult to ask for reasonable reasonable adjustments yeah it's very difficult to disclose your challenges yeah and I feel like I come from an access point of view so I I'm like doing an accessible consultancy course at the moment Mm -hmm. and I definitely feel like since being diagnosed it's almost like it's a family to me. So people with access needs and requirements, yep. I don't need to know what your challenges are. I don't need to know what your disability is, for yep. example. Yeah. But if I can see that there's something that may help you, mm. I will offer to put that in place or I'll just put that in place for you. When I, when people ask me about access requirements, mm. I think even with you, I don't, I don't say much. Yeah. 
because I'm very much built in to look after myself in that time. And when I arrive some, somewhere, yeah. if something's not, if something is aggravating or it's not accessible to me, yeah. then I'll, again, I'll vocalise and yeah. I will say, this would be better or... Yeah. No, but that's yeah. good. It's good that you. It's good that you can do that. Honestly, because yeah. there's so many of us that don't necessarily do that, even mm-hmm. when we really need to. Lauren, I want you to talk to me a little bit about what's it been like in your job role, um, being in the events industry, being in the music industry, and being a black woman. What has that been like? So definitely triple discrimination. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the first barrier that I noticed as a black woman was the fact that I was female and perhaps the fact that I was black I don't know which actually it was definitely the skin colour and I say that that, that's the first thing people see they just see that you're black and it's like okay then they decide how they want to treat you being a woman Mm -hmm. in this industry in particular so I started off in pubs Typically, that's not run by um, black women, especially younger black women. Yep. Um, so I actually had a lot of issues. I had um, a, a hate crime thing going on against me. Not, I wasn't doing it. It was against <laughs> me, just to clarify. Um, I had things like people would come into my pub mm. and they wouldn't want to put money in my hand. They wouldn't want me to serve them. Wow. Yeah, so I was like, really? For your £3 pint or your £2.80 <laughs> pint? Like, wow. my skin colour bothers you that much? It's crazy. Um, yeah, it is crazy. And um, again, another way that I don't know where this strength comes from, but just realising that that's really not a me problem, that is a you problem. Yeah. Um, and whether you come back tomorrow or next week, it's still going to be my black face mm-hmm. that's here. So you're going to have to either get, get used, used to it, it or find somewhere else to go because I'm not going anywhere. Um, so definitely my race played the biggest, has been one of the biggest barriers. Mm-hmm. Then, as I said, being female. Um, and then I feel like being neurodivergent because people don't see any difference with me. There's, they don't tend to see, they, they think, oh, you you look normal to me or you look fine. Yeah. Whatever that means. Yeah. Um, don't accept <laughs> the labels and all of this rubbish. That is, is another big barrier because then people don't tend to take the struggle seriously, whether it's an employer for me or a customer or... Right, because pe- they can't see it. They can't see anything, yeah. so... Not that you can see disability. I don't know what people expect. It's like, and I actually say this, if you see someone in a wheelchair, do you stop them and say, oh, how did you get in your wheelchair? Or Lauren, honestly, people do do that. No, they do do that. They act, no, genuinely, they do do that. People That's do. awful. It's, it's, it's crazy. I have yeah. a lot of friends that are wheelchair users. They, yeah, they, they get asked very strange questions. Yeah. yeah. It's mad. Like, what people ask is crazy and it's like, yeah it's like why would you even fix your mouth to ask somebody something like that um it's horrible but i hope less people in the world behave like that and i hope <laughs> that we could just build so much of an awareness and yeah. acceptance yeah of difference you mentioned a minute ago about labels mm-hmm. tell me what you feel because some people are really against labels. I feel like I know what you're going to say, but I want you to <laughs> tell the listeners because sometimes I feel like, th- I feel like back in the day, mm-hmm. there was like a stigma mm-hmm. around labels, especially if you're a neurodivergent, because mm-hmm. as you say, it's different to having a physical disability. Mm-hmm. People can't see it. They don't, they just, people just treat you differently. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I personally feel like labels are sometimes good because sometimes it helps you understand what you're going through and what you're dealing with and then you're able to, like, you know, explain it to other people. But how do you feel about labels? I agree with what you said. (laughs) (laughs) So I think it's definitely a culture thing. Yeah. Um, I think that there's a long way for... When we talk about race and disability or when I talk about race and disability... Yes, it's always good to speak to the side that the sides that hold the power dynamic. However, 
I also have to be very true and speak to the people where I come from. Yeah. And in my culture, in my family, people around me have even said, oh, you don't need the label. Oh, you're no different to us. <laughs> All of these yeah. things. I'm yeah. like, okay, yeah. I am. Yeah. <laughs> I accept my labels. Yeah. And if it wasn't for those labels, then I wouldn't be in a position where I am today I wouldn't be able to advocate for myself and mm -hmm. the differences and the way that I may present differently to people when I'm interacting on a daily basis so mm -hmm. I definitely think there is a lot of stigma um we're working on it we it's, are, it's, we are working we've come on a long it. way we will get that. but there's still a long way to go yeah. um and I feel like it is those two components I feel like as a black person with disabilities, you need to be supported by your own community. and your own community yeah. and where you come from. Yeah. Very close to you before you can really be accepted in that, in the broader world. So. 100%. No, 100%. And you're so right. And you're just bringing back so many memories because I'm like when I was younger, there would be people like, you know, friends of the family. Mm. Um, and they would literally like say to my parents, like, why can't she see like she's got some kind of curse on her oh, yeah. blah 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 like and we and as black people we do have to we have to talk about this because really honestly it does happen do you know what i mean not in every situation but for all of it it is that as you said it's that stigma like mm -hmm. oh don't put a label on it because da, 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 da. and mm. it's just like but sometimes we need that we need those labels because we need to understand ourselves yeah. and then we need other people to to understand things as well so that we can live our absolute best lives. It's, it's Absolutely. Mad. And also don't put the onus on us. We've never done anything exactly. to be the way that we are. We are just the way that we are and nobody's cursed us. We've done nothing bad in a yeah. previous life. All of this foolishness, yeah. just no. Yeah. I've got my label. Yeah. If I If I tell you my label, if I share that with you, just accept it. Yeah. Thank you. And that's 100%. it. There's no shame in it. <laughs> no. Like, there's literally no shame. If I'm not ashamed, then you shouldn't be ashamed to exactly. accept it. Just to hear what I'm saying. You don't have to accept <laughs> it, but just take it on board. Yeah. No, 100%. What advice would you give someone who may be listening to this mm -hmm. and wants to do something similar to what you're doing, working in events, working in the music industry, and they might have a disability or they might be neurodivergent? What would you say to someone listening? What advice? Do you have any advice for someone, what has helped you get to this stage? I'd definitely say, yeah, it's um, a lot of self-confidence. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have it, try and find an ally. And that person, it's great if if you can find an ally in your industry in particular. Okay. But if you can just find somebody who is, as I'm black, a black female, a black female who is disabled, any of these combinations that... Um, you can relate to mm. I feel like that would really help in building confidence and strength and having like a sounding board yeah to at least speak to and express yourself to because the world is a very scary place <laughs> do you feel like there's enough though do you feel like there's enough people black disabled people for <clears throat> us to to look up to and kind of do you feel like there's enough of a of a network or not really? I don't feel like people want to put themselves out there a lot. And I'm not just in the music industry. I also have a social enterprise that deals with black, female, neurodivergent people. And often I'm told that there aren't people, they didn't know pe people like themselves existed yeah. or they've never seen anybody like themselves. Mm -hmm. And that can be very overwhelming for the person and that can also be very overwhelming for me because then I have this superwoman thing that I take on I'm like oh, I've got to help everybody mm -hmm. but of course you can't help everybody so in answer to your question no I don't think there is enough representation mm -hmm. and I think things like what we're doing today what you're doing this project I think that is what helps to highlight um and I think to be able to make those connections you have to be you have to put yourself out there first. Yeah. And I understand that's not the easiest thing to do. Yeah. But it's a lot better than, and it's a lot easier than living in isolation. Yeah. And feeling like all of these problems that you might experience, no one else experiences. Yeah. And that's why I say, if there isn't, if you can't find somebody directly in your industry that's black, same gender, 
also has the same disabilities, start to, to take those apart a little bit. Um, start with a black female, start with a disabled black female and they can also help you to make those connections because they might know somebody. If somebody comes to me and they have disabilities that I don't know and I don't experience and understand, mm -hmm. I'll always signpost them. And if I don't know a direct person to signpost them to, mm -hmm. I will say, let me speak to my friend or let me speak to my colleague. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, yeah. really, that's really good advice, actually. I never actually thought about it like that, but I think that's, that's really good. Like finding a, a mentor, someone that you can kind of relate to is mm -hmm. definitely important. And... I mean, as you said, like off the back of the report um, that we've done in collaboration with Black Lives and Music and actually is everything, I feel like obviously we hope that the industry listens and mm -hmm. takes charge and actually does something about their industry because it needs changing. But while you're here, and this is my last question to you, what what would your message be to the music industry now? What would you what would you say to them? Because they will be listening, hundred percent. That's a very that's a heavy question. Um, I'd say to go back a little bit. To be clear, I have two mentors. I have a mentor in the music industry, mm -hmm. who is a white disabled woman. Mm -hmm. so she understands being disabled and she understands being a, a woman yeah. in this industry and how hard it is mm -hmm. and then I have somebody who I call my autism mum she's a black lady mm -hmm. um, so whilst my white disabled mentor in the music industry will never be able to understand the black experience and she wouldn't even try Yeah, um, she helps me a lot to build my confidence in, in the work tools that I have and to put me in those right places and right positions to have the meetings with the right people but my autism mum gives me that inner confidence um that I need to just be strong black powerful mm -hmm. and to accept that I am disabled and that's how it is yeah. and um what advice I'd give to other people in the industry is just be you because you is always more than enough mm -hmm. um and don't be afraid and when doors get closed in your face, there will another one will open. And that door necessarily, the way that I look at it, mm -hmm. wasn't for you. That wasn't the path that you were supposed to go down. Yeah. Um, and just persevere and be patient and just try and have a very positive outlook on life because that, for me, is what tends to get me through in situations where I feel like I don't belong here or this is really hard because we all have those moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I definitely feel like just be strong, confident in yourself. And you don't have to be overtly confident. You can just know in yourself, okay, fine. And then confer with one of your mentors or your friends and they say, no, you're right, that's fine. Yeah. Maybe that job wasn't for you. Yeah. Keep trying, keep going. And that's, that is probably the best advice that I could give right now. One last thing. Go on. <laughs> what would you like to see changed in the industry? What What would you like to see? Like, what is like the ideal picture? What What do you think needs to change the most? I'd like to see more black women in power, and I don't say black disabled women because people don't necessarily want or need to disclose their challenges. And I feel like if I had a scene somebody who looked like me growing up, then I would have been in this industry and I would have been more focused to go there sooner, whereas I kind of just fell into it and I love it. But I definitely feel like representation is key everywhere we go, in every role across the music industry, for example, mm. there needs to be black women in power in not tokenistic roles, yeah. in places where they can make decisions and to help other black people, black women, whoever, whoever, but just opening the door so we're not seeing one stereotype of person and thinking, okay, that's not achievable for me Yeah. because it is very much achievable. You just have to get through the, the sometimes rubbish, sometimes hard and stick at it. And that's, yeah, I've said just to persevere and just keep going and yeah. just know that you are always more than enough. Lovely. Thank you so much, Lauren. You're welcome. And <laughs> just want to say, 
wish you all the best with the baby. Thank you. Good luck. You'll be fine and yeah. can't wait to see pictures. Yes. Hopefully. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. I That's really, really fine. appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of Unseen Unheard. If you would like more information on the report, please go to the Attitude Is Everything's website or the Black Lives and Music's website where you can read the whole report and find out more.